Welcome to The Big Conversation here on Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley. The Big Conversation is a series of shows exploring faith, science, philosophy, and what it means to be human in association with the Templeton Religion Trust. Today, our conversation topic is the psychology of belief and do we need God to make sense of life? Well, the big conversation partners I'm sitting down with today are Jordan B. Peterson and Susan Blackmore. Jordan Peterson is a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto and author of the new book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. Jordan rose to prominence in 2016 when his stance on free speech and the threat of legal action for refusing to use transgender pronouns created a media storm. But since then, many new people have discovered his academic work, including a very popular lecture series on the psychology and wisdom of ancient Bible stories. And his new book, 12 Rules for Life, distills much of the wisdom into a guide to leading a meaningful life. Our other guest is Susan Blackmore. She's a psychologist, lecturer and author of books on consciousness and evolutionary psychology, including The Meme Machine and Seeing Myself, The New Science of -of Out-of-Body Experiences. And she views many forms of religion as fundamentally negative for human flourishing. She's written, for instance, that religions are an example par excellence of meme plexes that use wicked tricks to ensure their own survival. Well, today we'll be looking at the psychological roots of faith beliefs. Can we make our own rules for life or are we subject to some higher level of meaning? And are even atheists fundamentally religious deep down? I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. So Susan and Jordan, welcome along to the program. Thanks. Great to have you Thank here. you, Justin. Uh, we'll start with you, Jordan. Uh, you're a hard man to categorise in many ways. Um, your work actually attracts attention from both believers and non-believers. Uh, and many of um, whom say that you've actually made them consi- reconsider their views about religion, especially many atheists that I've heard on mm-hmm. who, who have said your work opens up things in a new way. Do you just tend to describe yourself as a religious man at all? Well, I would definitely describe myself as a religious man. Yeah, I think that's fundamentally true. The, the devil's in the detail. So, uh, <laughs> what does that mean exactly? I've seen you been asked the question, do you believe in God? And that's not a question you necessarily find it terribly easy to answer. Well, I don't know what people mean when they say believe. Mm. Like it's, it's as if that question explains itself when it's asked. It's like it doesn't. What do you mean by believe? What do you mean by God? And what makes you think that the question that I'm answering is the same one that you're asking? Mm. This is not something that you can say yes or no to in any straightforward manner. So I find it an off-putting question. And, and I don't think it's because I'm avoiding the issue. I, I think that to answer it properly requires books mm. and lectures. Like, yeah. And yeah. So do you see yourself at least in the Christian tradition as far as your, I suppose, worldview? Well, there's no, well, there's no doubt about that because I'm a Westerner. There's, mm. there's no escape from that. Yeah. I'm conditioned in every cell to, from, as a consequence of the Judeo-Christian worldview. And so I, I've read a fair bit in other religious traditions and have a, a reasonable grasp on some of them, I would say, not trying to overestimate my knowledge. Um, but we're saturated in Judeo-Christian ethics, and so... I've seen you say that you certainly live your life as though God exists. Yes, I would say, well, to the best of my ability, mm. right? Yeah, and I think that that's the fundamental hallmark of belief, is what you, it's how you act, not right. what you say about what you think you think. Sure. What do you know about what you think? Mm. Seriously, I mean, mm. we wouldn't need a psychology, yeah, yeah. an anthropology, a sociology, <laughs> any, of this, any of the humanities, if, if our thoughts were transparent to ourselves. They're not in the least. And you've well, been in the least they are, but you've been willing to be quite critical as well of some of the new atheists. So Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins. Um, what what have you made of their particular way of approaching? Oh, they religion? just don't take it seriously enough. They are, as far as I'm concerned, they they don't contend with the real thinkers. They oh, I know all three of them very well, <laughs> and I have deep, uh, great arguments with them, and they seem to be taking it seriously. <laughs> I I know what you mean. Uh, the, there's a certain sort of superficiality in the writings of all of them, but as people i find they well, they really care about oh, they care. issues yeah oh, they care. there's no doubt about that and 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 it's not like i'm i'm uh, not sympathetic to the atheist or rationalist claim i'm perfectly sympathetic to it but i don't believe that the level of discussion that's characteristic of dawkins and dennett and and Sam Harris, say, approaches the level of complexity of, say, Friedrich Nietzsche or Dostoevsky. Well, that would be asking quite a lot, wouldn't it? Yeah, but if you're going to play in that arena, (laughs) man, you're going to play with the heavyweights. But what I've noticed is it's a lot of people who maybe up to a point have been interested in what those people have been saying from the new atheist side who are also interested in what you're saying. There's an interesting sort of correlation there. Yeah, definitely. And, And why is it that especially some of these 
you know, potentially, and I see a lot of men in this audience mm-hmm. are, are coming to you, Jordan, to, to sort of sit at your feet and, and hear what you have to say at this point. Well, the new atheists have a hell of a, hell of a uh, time with an act of ethic. You know, they say, well, you can build an ethic on rationality. It's like, well, first of all, that's not self-evident. It's possible, but it's by no means self-evident. And and their, their, their essential existential concept is rather hollow. Like with Harris, for example, mm. um, we never, when I, I talked to him twice on two different podcasts, and we never really got to his sense of what the ideal society might be. But I've read his writings on, on the maximization of well-being, for example, and it's just, it's just, that's just not going anywhere. You can't even measure it properly. And if you're thinking about something mm. like that scientifically, that's, that turns out to be like, that's not a problem. It's a catastrophic problem. But so, Sam really goes deeply into the consequences of meditation, and he tells stories about his own experience of how behavior changes. Compassion seems to arise naturally. This is not based on rationality, which is not everything, and I, mm-hmm. I would agree with you there. It's based on practical experience, training in observing one's own thoughts, which is also of interest to you, and in the way behavior changes in ways which he would say, and also query whether it's true, that it's better behavior. Well, that being sure. compassionate mm-hmm. and kind to people is better. We can't have some great underlying reason why. If you don't have God, you know, it's a very, very difficult question. You, you've got to find some basis. But even without one, Sam is trying to say, as I would, that if you spend a lot of time meditating and really becoming to understand yourself and see the consequences of certain thoughts and actions, then better actions follow. I, I, that's one of the things I like yeah, about his work. I, well, and, and I'm, I'm certainly not questioning his, questioning his ethical integrity or his commitment to these problems, um, although I certainly don't think that compassion or kindness constitutes a sufficient grounds for a, like a transcendent, e- transcendent ethic, not, not in the no. least, partly because both, and I'm sp- I can speak about that technically to some degree, compassion is associated with trait agreeableness fundamentally, mm-hmm. and, agree- and agreeableness is a great short-term strategy for infants. <laughs> But it's a very bad lo- medium to long-term strategy for adults, and it's by no means a, a, the ground upon which an entire complex society can rest. And that's partly what you see playing out right now in the political world, because the politically correct types are very high in compassion. We have research that demonstrates that. And so, and there, but that ethic doesn't work for a sophisticated society. We were only doing introductions. We're already yeah. well, in, well into <laughs> yes, the... Uh... I, it's my fault. I started. I interrupted. <laughs> but let's come to you, Sue. Um, you may be familiar to some unbelievable listeners who have already heard you on the show before. Um, you, I think you're happy to describe yourself as an atheist. Does Indeed. that mean for you that you are a naturalist, someone who's committed to a view that our experiences can be fully explained by a purely material world? N- no. I mean, I, I've, you know, I sign up in a way to naturalism uh, groups and, 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 and beliefs, but because I work on consciousness such a lot and the problem of how do we relate the mind-body problem, you know, here's this table, here's my glass of water. We'll agree that if I go like this, it'll go all over the place. And ruin the microphone. And ruin the microphone. (laughs) How does that relate to my, the taste of the water? You know, these fundamental problems mean I have big queries about naturalism as you described it there. Okay. In a much broader sense, yes. Um, as you know, and many listeners will know, I started out being a parapsychologist and rejected ideas of clairvoyance and telepathy and ghosts and poltergeist because of lack of evidence. So that's one way to naturalism to throw that lot out. Um, I was brought up like like you as a Christian, um, and I threw that out because in the end it didn't make sense to me. So that's another way to mm. say I'm left with naturalism, but I'm not left with a naturalism that explains everything. Right. I'm left with a feeling that that's what I want to try to do to understand what's going on here in minds, in bodies, in tables and glasses of water, and it's very difficult. You're well known for picking up the idea of memes that sort yep. of originated at some level with Richard Dawkins and um, the idea of a, an idea propagated across generations. And um, and you even went as far as to describe religion as a virus of the mind in terms of its that was m- That was Richard's term, but uh, yes, OK. Is yeah. that a, a kind of view you would still stand by today? Yes, but you've got to be careful about what you mean by a virus. I mean, I think if... I, I often say in lectures, Im- imagine a continuum between um, what you mean as being a virus of the mind. It's really bad. You know, it's like like the flu virus. Mm. Or Usually we or think something. of a virus Usually in negative terms. And, yes. yes, and they aren't always. So imagine that you think, you know, religions is utterly bad or you think religions utterly wonderful and utterly good mm. and all in between. I think Richard is way down there mm. and I'm somewhere here. I think by and large, on balance, the world would be a better place without any religions. But 
the, the religions would not thrive if they didn't have within them things which are positive. I mean, we know at a personal level, at a society level, the worst societies have, are more religious. At a personal level, there's evidence that people are happier and they have better social connections and so on if they're religious. So I don't think we would be stuck with these horrible memes if it weren't for the fact that they also have some good qualities. What, what do you make of the whole meme theory and the fact that Sue does feel ultimately... A, I think it's a shallow derivation of the idea of archetype and that Dawkins would do well to read some Jung. In fact, if he thought farther and wasn't as blinded by his a priori stance about religion, he would have found that the deeper explanation of meme is in fact archetype. I disagree. I mean, you, Can you, you just first of all explain archetype for those who are not perhaps familiar with that particular psychological Well, an archetype term. is partly a, a pattern of behavior that's grounded in biology. So it's the behavior itself. Um, so you could think about that as both the instinct and the manifestation of that instinct, but it's also the representation of that pattern. So part of what's coded in our mythological stories, for example, are images of typical patterns of behavior. And those are the typical patterns of behavior that make us human. I really want to have this discussion about memes, by mm. the way, because, because it's a really a discussion that needs to be had. Because I, I think that the, the meme idea is very interesting, and I, I do think that there are contagious ideas, but that needs to be chased down much deeper because there are ideas that are so contagious that we've actually adapted to them biologically. Mm. And so, and once that happens, they're not only, they're no longer merely memes, they're something else, they're built into us. I can, I can give you- These archetypes as you describe Yeah, well, I can give yeah. you a kind of example of that. So imagine, I'll have to try to do this relatively rapidly. It's very complicated, so I'm, I'm hoping I can do it. So imagine that, we live in dominant hierarchies. We don't have to imagine that. That happens to be the case. They're at least 350 million years old. So they're really, really old. So the idea of the archetype of, of dominance is older than our ability to perceive trees, right? It's really down there. And our, our nervous system is fully adapted to the existence of dominance hierarchies. It's one of the things the serotonergic system tracks. Okay, so now we also know that your position in a dominance hierarchy, especially if you're male, is proportionate to your reproductive success. The higher you up in the hierarchy, the more likely you are to succeed. Okay, so what that means is that males have been selected for their ability to move up a dominance hierarchy, but that's not quite right. They've been selected for their ability to move up the set of all possible dominance hierarchies. And that's a very abstract mm. set. And there's a set of characteristics that go along with the ability to move up the set of all possible dominance hierarchies that's represented in religious terms as the optimal ethical manner in which to conduct yourself. I see. And that's, that's not a meme that's casually passed mm, from mm. person to person. It's, it's way, 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 way deeper, deeper than that. I, yeah. I think you're being unfair to memes. I, I, I would make this response here about the difference between memes and archetypes. So archetypes are there whether we have memes or not. All of that history yes, of, of evolution is enough, there. Yes. So we have, you know, ideas about sex differences or ideas about um, uh, dominance is a very good example that don't require memes. They can then become memes. And a meme by definition, as Dawkins started it out, is that which is imitated or that which is copied from person to person. So the idea of dominance hierarchies can be a meme and all the ideas we build on top of that as long as we pass it from person to person. Now, yeah, we could certainly think of hierarchies of memes from from, yes, indeed. You know, from ones that are no more than than, than fads but, that but wash you, across the culture to but, ones that are permanent But you were kind of trivializing memes. And I think the power of the idea of memes is this. We have the first replicator genes on the on the planet and we know the consequences of that um, uh, producing all these organisms but the idea about memes is that they are a second replicator so genes are copied by chemical processes in 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 bodies memes are copied by imitation and other kinds of interactions between human beings and very little in any other species at all and that's what gives rise to culture so the whole theory about memes is uh, is one of many ways of trying to understand the evolution of culture and mm. in, that, in that way, I say it's not, not trivial quick, quick at all. response, and I want to move on to talking about the 12 rules, Jordan. Well, the, 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 the issue is what happens when a meme is so widely distributed that it becomes a determining factor in evolution itself. Because ah, it translates. Meme gene co-interaction. Yes, yeah, exactly. Well, see, that's where I yeah. think, well, that's where I think the religious, that's, for me, that's the grounds of the essential religious instinct. It's, it's a meme gene interaction, and it goes back forever. Yes, yes. And, I, and then, so, and I'll, I'll finish I, with this. Mm. 
see, because once you see that there's a meme gene interaction and that there's selection in favor of a certain meme, let's say, then, then you open up the entire question of what constitutes the underlying reality. Because, Indeed. see, one, this is <clears throat> something I, tr I tried to have a talk with about Sam Harris and we augured in very rapidly. You could say that reality is that which selects. Now, it's not exactly a materialist viewpoint. It's more of an evolutionary viewpoint. And if reality is that which selects, then what's selected by that reality is in some sense correct. Now, that's not, uh, well, <laughs> this is why uh, I- Yeah, you're adding on. A, I mean, that, that's a big claim you're adding on. I, I know it's a big claim. I understand it's a big claim, but it's also the central I claim of pragmatism. Let's, let's move it on just a bit, because yep. this is all fascinating stuff. <laughs> yes. I, I do want to talk about the book, which I, I read, found, really interesting Jordan 12 rules for life very much drawing actually on your biblical series as well um and and that was interesting to me it's almost like I don't know psychological theology or something like that I'm not sure what what term to give it but you you constantly draw um throughout it, it it's it's a rule book for helping people to lead m meaningful lives very practical in that sense mm -hmm. but stacked with illustrations and stories from biblical stories uh, Adam and Eve the flood Cain and Abel and so on mm -hmm. and Jesus as well what, why has that particularly been your focus recently to explain life and psychology from this very religious standpoint? Well, I wouldn't say recently. I think I've been doing this since about 1985. But the reason, the, the, there's multiple reasons. The, the reason, fundamental reason, is because I was trying to solve two problems, three problems, I would say. One would be the problem of how to live in the face of the undeniable tragedy of life. The other is what to do with the fact that malevolence exists. And the, I, well, those are the two most fundamental questions, the, 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 and they're interrelated mm. because what happens is that the apprehension of tragedy is one of the things that drives people towards, towards malevolence. I have a chapter in there called Don't Criticize the World Until You Put Your House in Order, and I draw writings there from some of the worst people about, about whose actions I'm familiar with, like the Columbine High School shooters and mass murderer named Carl Panzram, who's a very insightful person. And I've tried to track how it is that people develop a malevolent attitude towards mm, being, I would yeah. say, towards life. And that's intrinsically associated with tragedy. Well, these great stories that we have, part of the substructure of our culture, are, are antidotes to both malevolence and tragedy. That, that's what, and, and I mean that, I'm not necessarily even saying that they're successful antidotes, but the reason that they were formulated, the deep reason, is as a response to the tragic conditions of life and to malevolence. And then my experience in delving into these stories and is that the farther I delve into them, the deeper they get, and that never ends. Just when I think I've got to the bottom of a story, like the story of Cain and Abel, which is like 12 sentences long. I mean, it's so short, it's unbelievable. It has no bottom. And that's a really fascinating phenomena. I guess it's partly, like the Bible is a hyperlink text, mm. you know, so that every verse refers to many other verses. And so you never get to the end of it in some sense. But then it's also hyperlinked with the entire culture around mm. it. Mm. And so, and then I also think that because the stories in Genesis, especially the first part of Genesis, are deeply mimetic in the sense that, that you've been describing, that they, they have a kind of biological depth that's mm, unparalleled as own. well. Yes, they have a life of their own, that's for sure. A life that lasts a lot longer than the mere lives of mortals, let's say. So And and you, you the, the 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 rules all have, you know, quite fun titles in a way. In fact I think they originally came from a blog post you put up on a on an internet website, but you've obviously developed them in, in all kinds of different ways. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. Rule number two, treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping. Number three, make friends with people who want the best for you, and so on. Um I guess I'd be interested to know what your response, having had a chance to look at the book, is to this way of looking at life and the, how we create meaning for ourselves in the process. Uh, <laughs> is, is my reaction, if you like. It's so full of lovely stories, really interesting, thought-provoking stories. Wisdom, lo lots of wisdom all over the place. Then the Bible stories. Then this... You just don't understand that? You don't get why the Bible oh, is yes. being invoked? I, well, I get it, it in this sense, that those stories, many of them, are very deep and have something to tell us. But it's the way I think that Jordan kind of slithers from um, a good idea about this might be a good way to 
to live your life to this story. I mean, let, let me give you an example. You, you talk about, um, with great knowledge, um, about the evolution, the evolutionary arms race between the size of babies' heads and the size of women's um, pelvises. And this is something that's always fascinated me. I think it's meme driven that, um, you know, we've ended up with b- childbirth being painful, as I well know, and you probably don't, <laughs> um, how painful it is um, uh, for, for those reasons. But then later in the book, you bring in the story of um, Adam and Eve and how God says, you know, women will suffer and, you know, and so on. And the implication, not clearly stated, but the implication to the reader is God did it. Now, on the one hand, you're saying, look, we evolved this way. This pain and suffering is an inevitable consequence of the way that, that evolution has played out. And in the other, you're kind of luring people into believing that God actually made that. And even worse than that, the idea that, uh, that it at least speaks to me, that somehow we're so bad and deserve all that suffering, which in other well, places in the book you try and get rid of, that Jordan we, shouldn't, to say feel, to that, we that. shouldn't feel so wicked and bad. How do you respond to that, Jordan? Well, you asked a little bit earlier about you were talking about psychological theology. Mm. You know, and I did this lecture series on Genesis, um, 15 lectures on Genesis, and it was called a psychological interpretation of the biblical story, psychological approach to the biblical stories, I think. And I've been trying to do that. Like, I'm not a theologian, mm. um, even though I'm very interested in these stories. And what I was trying to do with... See, I do believe that the biblical texts are foundational. Mm. I believe it in the Nietzschean sense, and you know Nietzsche, of course, announced famously in the late 1800s, 1800s that God was dead, and the typical rationalist atheist regards that as a triumphalent, triumphalist proclamation. But that wasn't that for Nietzsche, and Nietzsche knew perfectly well and said immediately afterward that the ca- consequences of that was going to be bloody catastrophe because mm. everything was going to fall, and he predicted the rise of communism, for example, and the deaths of tens of millions of people in the aftermath of the death of God. Because Nietzsche knew perfectly well that when you pull the cornerstone out from underneath a building, that even though it may stay aloft in midair like a cartoon character that's wandered off a cliff for some period of time, that it will inevitably crumble Mm. and that it will be replaced by something that's perhaps far worse. Now, Nietzsche hoped it would be it would be replaced by man's ability to recreate meaning spontaneously out of his psyche, for example, which I think is a doomed enterprise. But he knew that in the interval, it would be replaced by both nihilism and by communist totalitarianism, which is a hell of a prediction because it it was done like 40 years before the events actually unfolded. Well, so. you, you can you, you can see it that way. But if that is the case, why do we have evidence that the most um, dysfunctional societies today are the most religious? And, for example, in the United States of America, the higher, if you go across different states, the higher belief in God is proclaimed belief in God, whatever you think that means, um, the the more uh, murders, suicide, marital breakdown, um, various measures of dysfunctional society are. Well, it depends on how you define religion in part. I mean, first of all, America is a very religious country. Mm. And to think of it as a country that's doing worse than other countries in the world is just not the case well, at all. Well, its incarceration rate is higher than any other... Well, true, si- but so uh, is its standard society. of living and it's, and, it's, and it's, what would you say, ability to provide the basic essentials of life for people and and the essential freedoms that go along with that. You wouldn't compare well, that to an African dictatorship. No, example. no, no. But most of these studies have been done only in developed societies. But there, if you look at income inequality, that's much worse in the States. So yes, a lot of people in the States have a very high standard of living, but the poorest are really poor. Yes, well, really in, income, in, in, income and, inequality. You know, with with yes. Obamacare being dismantled and so on. Well, but but nevertheless, let me go back to that point. We know that more dysfunctional societies have higher proclaimed belief, higher attendance in church and so on. Now, this doesn't fit with what you were saying. Now, Nietzsche's ideas are very profound and interesting, but I just want to stop you from saying that he was absolutely right about somehow if, if we get rid of God, we're going to be worse because we have very well-functioning societies well, we in were Scandinavia, pretty, We were pretty example. bad in the 20th century. Oh, we were, yes, yes. people were. And, but, and, we, and we could easily drift that way again. And there have been terrible bad things done in the name of God, and there have been terrible bad things done in the name of communism and, 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 and atheism. I don't think we can I don't so you, want to you don't weigh think them the up. God, the God. I'll weigh them up. You'll weigh, weigh them up, up and you'll no say... Problem. No problem. But then Let's you give, have to give, go against this evidence that well, I've we'll just give, stated. Jordan, come back on this evidence. I mean, obviously, from her perspective, Sue feels like actually... We've, we've got pretty stable societies that are increasingly secular these days. So perhaps Nietzsche was wrong. And in fact, we're not going to see this. Moral, well, I would moral say they're, they're stable to the degree that they're actually not secular. 
And uh, this is also a Nietzschean observation and a Dostoevskian observation for that matter, is that we're living on the corpse of our ancestors like we always have. That's a very old idea. Mm. But that, run, you, that, runs, that stops being nourishing and starts to become rotten unless you replenish it. And I don't think we are replenishing it. We're in danger of running. We're living on borrowed time and in danger of running out of it. Um, I like I. I think that the reason that the Western societies essentially work quite well is because they act out a Judeo-Christian ethic and one that's essentially predicated. It's predicated on um, utmost regard for the sovereignty of the individual. So the individual is sovereign in relationship to the state, which is a remarkable idea and one that's fundamentally religious in its in its in its essence. In my m mode of mode of thinking, and that's also predicated on honest speech and there's there's other predi predicates at all as well, but those are religious predicates in my estimation. There's a section actually, Sue, in Jordan's book where he says this, Christianity elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master, commoner and nobleman alike on the same metaphysical footing, rendering them equal before God and the law. It's nothing short of a miracle. Um, he has a very high view of what Christianity has done for the world, whether or not it's objectively true. Yeah. What, yes, do, you, what I, do you take from it? Well, uh, that evidence that I was dis discussing earlier that there's plenty of now that the most dysfunctional societies are also the most believing societies. There are lots of hypotheses about why that is the case. But I would like to challenge Jordan on the implication that he put before that because a lot of these um, of, of, our, of our moral stance today comes from religion and not all of it does that that it has to have that as a basis i don't think it does i feel very grateful to live in a country where now at last the majority uh, are not religious it's just tipped over in the la latest polls and in fact coming up on the train from devon today i got chatting with various people the assumption that i find here i don't know what it's like in canada is i always start with assuming someone's an atheist and it nearly always turns out to be there oh yeah all that religion stuff you know it's very very common in this country now we have not descended into being a terrible country um we have you know yes we have our problems we're but still fairly early on in the in the experiment, I suppose, of ditching well, God. Well, like about yes. 10 years. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, I will await with interest and hope I live long enough to see. But then if we look at many of the Scandinavian countries, which are way ahead of us in, the, in that move, they have wonderful um, uh, health systems, um, welfare state, support for people out okay. of work well, and so on. I, I'd be really interested in hearing your response to all this then, Jordan. D d ultimately, we can divorce the, the good principles that we may have had in some respects from religion, from religion ultimately, and still leave Yes. Perfectly happy. Well, it depends. Life. See, a lot of this depends on your definition of religion. Like I know perfectly well from my own empirical studies that there's at least two disparate sets of phenomena that might be regarded as religious. Right? There's the dogmatic element, which is really what Sue's referring to when she talks about the pathology of religious belief, and there's the spiritual element. And the dogmatic element tends to appeal to people who are essentially conservative in their temperamental nature, and I mean that scientifically mm -hmm. speaking. And the um, meaningful element, the, the spiritual element, let's say, tends to um, appeal to people who are more liberal in their in their uh, temperamental fundamentals. And religion, overall, is a continual dialogue between the dogmatic element and the spiritual element. And if either of those exceeds its proper boundaries, then there's a degenerative okay. consequence. Like if the spiritual types get the upper hand, then the structure disappears, and if the dogmatic types get the upper hand, then everything clamps down into too much stasis. So to, to make a, a, a direct claim, say, between the existence of dogmatic belief and the pathology of society, and then to assume that that encompasses the entire relationship between religion and the functioning of society, I think is a, based upon a narrowing of, an unfortunate narrowing of the definition of what constitutes religious. But then back to the idea that, that our moral claims can be divorced from the religious substrate. It mm. depends on what you mean, and here we go with the definition, by moral substrate, you know, the, the, or, or religious substrate. Let's say that I regard you as um, a sovereign individual. Well, the question is, what does that mean? It might just be an opinion. It might just be a meme. It might be reflective of something far deeper, so deep that if we transgress against it, it will be fatal. And my investigations have convinced me that that's exactly the case, that although it may be a rational claim, it may be an enlightenment claim as well, that there's something underneath it that's so much deeper than that, that to reduce it to mere rationality or to mere enlightenment claim is to do it an immense disservice. And also to fall prey, I would say, to the postmodern quandary, because the postmodern quandary is um, 
all belief systems are equally invalid. It's something like that. Mm. And that's a real problem when you try to erect a belief system on purely rational axioms. So, and you can't, besides that, you, you can't even do it. It's like, I don't respect you as an individual mm. for rational means. The rationality didn't precede my respect for you. Mm. It's way deeper than that. It's embodied, for example. It's, and it's you, built into our emotions you, you and have our motivations. This issue with rationalism and the enlightenment and so on, where you, you feel that those who appeal to that as somehow we, we're in this golden age now are forgetting that it's all built on a much deeper, longer evolutionary psychological history, which which com is completely different to, to rationalism per se. Yeah, you well, know, I see a university professor. Let, let's take Dawkins for example. He's pre he's he's the sovereign rational individual, but there's a there's a wall around him. That's the wall, let's say, of his university. And then outside the university, there's the wall of the town. And outside the town, there's the wall of the, of the state and the wall of the country. And there's just these concentric rings that are protecting him. And he can stand in the middle and say, well, I'm divorced from all that. It's not under, it doesn't undergird me. It's like it undergirds you to a degree that you can't possibly imagine. And you're, you're, you're living on, on the, well, really, it is, it is the resources that have been gathered painfully and bloodily in the past and saying, well, we can just detach ourselves from that and float off. It's like, no, you can't. You don't understand what you're talking about. All that leads me to gratitude for all that we have. I mean, I, I recognize that. I recognize that nothing to do with any religious basis at all. I recognize that I could not come on the train here, have a really interesting discussion, meet Justin again, have a nice glass of cool water, you know, without a load of other people doing it for me. That gratitude, which is one of the things that you quite rightly yes. put in into your book it gives gives good place to it and it's a very important um that doesn't come from anything religious unless you say because i was brought up a christian it came from there but i don't base it on that anymore i, I would what like do you think it comes from i think it comes from a recognition that um I've done a lot of meditation. I've meditated every day for 30 years and i think this has something to do with it but it's observing the inner consequences of different ways of confronting the world. And I'm much more in recent years in the habit of waking up in the morning, even if it's raining in January in England, <laughs> and looking out and going, oh, and it's, it's a feeling of gratitude, not gratitude towards God or towards anybody or anything, just free floating gratitude. That seems to have a positive consequence. I set the day up better and it's kind of self-perpetuating. It pops up again and again. Do you again. think you can just have gratitude in general or must gratitude always be given towards something and ultimately well that, that that's a good question that 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 goes back to our discussion about acting things out like gratitude is something you feel towards something and you can say well i don't feel it towards anything in particular and i would say all right well the diffuse nothing that you feel it towards serves in your psychological hierarchy as your equivalent of god oh uh, so, no but it's gratitude you know this morning for example I looked out and it was so um, green. Uh, we've had frosts and it's been white the last few days and it was green this morning and it was just gratitude to the universe, if you like. It's not really God because it's not a creator. It's not anything I can pray to. It's, I mean, I well, know. I feel gratitude towards it. Then. I don't know, but I find That's it. Fine. I, I know that you tackle in this book that, that happiness is not an ultimate good and I, I no, struggle no, this way. it's just right. not an ultimate goal. Oh, okay. I didn't all right. say it wasn't an ultimate all right, goal. All right, all right, okay. You're, There's a big you, difference you, yes, between those right, things. You're right, you picked me up correctly on that. Um, nevertheless, we are happiness-seeking creatures, and I have found through practice and growing older that acting gratitude, thinking gratitude, feeling gratitude makes me happier and seems to okay, kind of so rub off I, on other okay, people. So I don't, I don't think we are happiness-seeking creatures, and I think it's a low goal. Not because there's something wrong with being happy, because, you know, thank God if you get to be happy now and then. But I don't think that that's what we seek. I think we seek a meaning that's deep enough to sustain us through tragedy. And that is way different. Do you know, when I hit some, I, I, tragedy is too strong a word, um, I think, I'm, I, but if when, I, when, I, when horrible things happen to me, or I feel, or I read some terrible thing going on in the world, yes, those are tragedies going on in the world, um, my response is, nothing matters, it's all empty and meaningless. This is how the world is, get used to it. Get on with it, girl. 
That sounds like a very Zen Buddhist way of dealing. I guess with, it. I with, guess it is. Well, it's a fun, it's a paradoxical way, though. It is the kind first, of paradoxical. The first part of that is nihilistic, and the second part isn't. So, well, how do you reconcile those two things? Which, Why get on with it, girl? Because oh oh well, here's another thing. I've often done this with my students. Let's suppose you become nihilistic. Uh, nothing matters. There's no point in doing. It. I mean, I think we live in a pointless universe. What are you going to do? And I say to them, like William James in his wonderful thing about getting up in the morning, um, but that's a slightly different point that he makes there. But I say to them, okay, tomorrow morning when you wake up, think it's all pointless. I d there's no point in doing anything. Now, what are you going to do? Well, actually, you're going to need to go to the loo. You're going to get out of bed and you're going to go to the bathroom. And when you're there, you'll think, well, actually, I'm hungry. I think, well, I think I want to go down to the kitchen. Oh, I probably should put my slippers on. Why don't I get dressed? You go and have something to eat. And then you think, I'm bored. And you go to university and go into your lectures. And, you know, we are not creatures who will just not do anything. To me, to go through that process, which I've done in the past a lot, and it's just natural now, is, um, is, a, is a very positive way of living to accept the meaningless and ultimate emptiness of everything and accept that this creature here, this thing, this evolved creature just will get on with life. But, but, but you're not accepting the meaninglessness of it, even by going through those actions that you, you described. You don't think so? Well, not well, at all, because you you're, that? because you're acting as if well, those things are meaningful. Yes, I am. I'm right. acting okay. as though those so things are meaningful. Are you pretending so that they're meaningful? Pardon? Are you pretending that they're meaningful? No, I'm not pretending. I'm, I'm, my way of putting it would be that those meanings are constructed by myself and others. They're personal and, and right. they're because, than, because but, the kind of creatures we are, because of the meme, meme But they're plexus, not constructed. Because, I'd like to hear Hunger is constructed. Neither is your desire to use the loo. None of that's constructed. No, no. But the fact that there is a loo <laughs> is part yes. of culture. Yes. Yeah, well, thank God for that. that. You know, yeah. yeah. But see, oh, you see, thank God would you see, do that. Well, <laughs> sorry, that's a poor joke. Well, you see, <laughs> see so imagine this. You, you have the proximal meanings that you described that are sort of a priori, right? Yep. They're handed to you. You might consider them as needs or drives, although they're yes. not. They're personalities. It's not the right way of conceptualizing them. Um, but, but then there's the intermingling of all those needs and drives, let's say. And that, that constitutes a new layer of structure because it isn't just that you have to eat and that you have to use the washroom and that you have to have something to drink and that you have to be warm enough or cool enough to survive. It's that you have to do all those things at the same time in a situation where you're going to have to propagate that across time and you're going to have to do it with a bunch of other people. Yep. And it's always been like that. And yep. so what that means is that out of those proximal meanings, higher meanings arise. And you might say, well, those meanings are arbitrary. And I would think I those are religious meanings. I wouldn't meanings. say they are arbitrary, but I would say they were constructed. And it's very interesting. Reading well, your what book. What do you mean by constructed? Um, well, they are a consequence of, of mimetic evolution, of the, of the language that, that people are brought up in, the culture they live in, the arguments they have. I mean, What about the biology that they're given? Well, we start with the biology and the memes build on top of that. Now the memes are biology too. Well, by definition, they are, well. See, this I, is the I thing. Would, this I is would the follow thing. Dawkins in saying, well, talk about genes as biology, talk about memes as culture. That's all I meant by dividing that. But let me say this. Yeah, Re but I don't accept that division. But I, don't I want think to get back to what we're saying division. about meaning. Well. Reading, reading your book made me think a lot about what, what you mean by meaning and your claim that we should have a meaningful life or strive for a meaningful life, that meaningfulness is important. And I kept asking myself, do I, uh, do I live that way? What meanings does my life have? And, you know, if I think of something like, well, that most of my striving goes into writing my books. <laughs> and is that meaningful? And again, I have the same response when I ask myself that question. It's just what this body does. It, it, then it, you should listen to the body and stop listening to the thing that's criticizing it. And what would the body say? It would say, write your book and try to be as clear as you yeah, possibly can about it. Yeah, that's what I do. It. And that's right, exactly, exactly what I what do. that's exactly what I said at the beginning, is that the atheist types act out a religious structure and no, criticize it. No, no religious well, structure. Oh, let, we let come get, to this let big get, question Let me get now. to this question, because yes, I did want to get to this, because right. you, you have a fascinating part in your book, um, Jordan, where you, you do say this. You're simply not addressing atheists. You say you're simply not an atheist in your actions. And it is your actions. Or if that you are, look out. <laughs> and it is your actions that most accurately reflect your religious beliefs. What do you mean by that? Why are you saying that no one is really an atheist deep down? I didn't say no one was. Okay. I said that most of the people who claim to be atheists aren't. So this is why I like Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, 
because Raskolnikov tried to act like an atheist, right? He, he took the ideas that were floating around, Dostoevsky took the ideas that were floating around in the late 1800s, which are still the ideas that we're discussing today. One most fundamental idea, I suppose, being after Nietzsche's uh, announcement of the death of God, that if there is no God, then anything is permitted. That was Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov's the criminal in crime and punishment, the murderer. He gets away with his murder, uh, you know, technically, but not psychologically. And he decides that if there's no God, anything is permitted. But and this he can't doesn't see have a reason. to be true. That's a that's a a, a, a person in a, a character in a novel. Um, I don't think that that's so. Well, let, let's hear the end of that story. And what 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 do you take away from what Dostoevsky has to say about? Well, Dostoevsky's takeaway was too was that there was a moral law that Raskolnikov was breaking, even though he he rationalized his way through it. Like he committed the perfect murder, right? Mm. He murdered a woman who people would have voted to murder, mm. and then he got away with it. And he did it for good reasons, at least r reasons that he could mm. rationalize as good. And then he got away with it, but it destroyed his soul. And, and Dostoevsky's right about that. And one of the things I like about Dostoevsky as compared to Nietzsche, say, because I think Dostoevsky is the profounder of the two, is that in, in the Brothers Karamazov, for example, Ivan is the atheist, and Ivan is everyone, everything you'd want a man to be, like seriously. And Dostoevsky, man, he doesn't straw man his opponents. Mm. The most powerful characters in his books are always the opponents of what he himself believes. And Ivan is always arguing with Alyosha, who's his younger brother, who's a monastic novitiate and really can't articulate himself very well, has nowhere near the force or charisma of Ivan. Mm. But Alyosha wins the drama, even, even though he loses all the arguments. And that's where Dostoevsky is so great. It's like, and, 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 and this is what you're doing in your life. You're, you're acting, look, you're acting out the logo, Susan. Right. That's what you're doing. What? You're writing books to illuminate the world. Yes. You say, and well, I don't believe in that. that's not coming from a place like, of, yes, of meaninglessness. Don't you think it's kind of uh, offensive to say to me that, that I'm not an atheist when I am? I, 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 why don't you, answer me this question. Why do you think I don't go around murdering people? Why do you think I go around trying to be... Um, I don't know you well enough to know. <laughs> I think I could have done some <laughs> I think You're often right. the reason that people done. don't do it is because they're too cowardly. Oh, that could be a reason. It could be that I don't murder people. I'd really no, love to. No, I'm not to. necessarily saying <laughs> no, you... No, it's well, a possible uh, one. It's all in right, fact right. highly likely at yes. some times in your life but if you're a normal very... person. <laughs> We're needing to well, close things out. And, and I, I, I know, I know. It's, it's, we've had not long enough. But, Jordan... Just come back to this because I want to hear why ultimately, despite everything that Sue said there, you still think she's behaving as though there is, in some sense, a God or some ultimate meaning, even though she protests that, no, that's that's. Well, I would say she's acting it out. Well, for example, the act of writing a book. I mean, the Judeo-Christian culture is the culture of the book. It's it's the revelation of the proper mode of being in written form. It's not only that, but it's it's a large it's a large part of that. It's the culture of the book. You're acting out the culture of the book. It's thousands of years old, and the voice, the true voice in the culture of the book, is the logos. That's what it is, technically speaking. And so she's acting out the logos and writing a book. It's like, and then she says, "Well, I don't believe in God." It's like, okay, that's the, fine. The logos, acting of course, in, like you do is fine. In, in scripture, do. in the New Testament, is is the word brought, is brought into the word, and it of course yeah, relates the word to that brings order and, out of and chaos. to Jesus Christ as yes. as the sort of personification almost of that. Right, uh, he's the archetypal manifestation of the logos. I mean, that's, that's these are all big words and things. Right. I mean, a lot of people will be asking, "What do you actually make of?" In Christian terms, the figure of Jesus. Do you, do you believe that he was, in some sense, um, divine? Was there, you know, when you look at what the Bible tells us about Jesus? Well, one thing you might ask yourself is, do you believe that each individual is divine, in some sense? And I would say, well, perhaps not, but you act as though you do, and our law acts as if it does. It's predicated on that idea because the sovereignty of the individual is the divinity of the individual. There's no difference between those two things, and I can make an absolutely brutally clear case for the development of that idea historically. Mm, mm. I've traced it back to Mesopotamia, at least in its earliest written forms. I mean, originally the only real sovereign individuals were, were the sovereigns, right? The, the, mm. the emperors mm. and pharaohs. But that the idea of the sovereign individual descended down the hierarchy of power, so to speak, until with Christianity it was universalized. We're each sovereign individuals, and that means that the law itself is written as if we each contain a spark of divinity. And so then I think, well, what is that divinity? And in the Christian worldview, well, that's the logos. That's the true speech that brings forth habitable and good order 
from the chaos of and, potential. And in your view, whether she likes it or not, Sue is at some level a benefactor of that reality of what not, not a are. contributor. Not yeah. no, not only a benefactor, much better than merely being a benefactor, an active contributor. It's no easy thing to write a book and to get your thoughts straight and to put them forward into the world. But, but she couldn't do it without without this idea, in a sense of of God. That she doesn't need the it. idea; even it's embodied. It's, okay. She's acting but it out. The one one of the consequences of the way I've been thinking about it, and Sam Harris talks about this too, is the way I think about it prevents me going, ooh, I'm so clever, I've written a brilliant book. Um, I mean, it doesn't always. I have those <laughs> thoughts come up, but I've got quite good at seeing them coming up and going, oh, there comes that thought again, um, because I'm taking the view that these books are, the memes are doing it through this this organism here. And I have that fun. would be the that would be the eternal logos manifesting itself. All right, if you want to no, but, it in no, those but terms. I'm not I'm not playing games. Like that's the oldest language we have for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And the, the logos that I'm talking about is the integration of those motivational forces that you were describing. And it's not merely a meme. Like that's that's where Dawkins ha Dawkins is wrong about that. There isn't biology and memes. The interactions matter. They're crucial. They're crucial. Some of these memes are millions of years old but you've and slipped plenty. away if i can bring you back to to justin's question really because you slithered out of it i think in your question was was jesus different from the rest of us by by saying oh we've all got a spark of divinity but do you then believe that jesus was somehow divine in a sense that's other than what i am <laughs> what was that you know did he do miracles was he you know all all of that stuff that quick makes answer him... and then we'll finish with a final a question. quick answer <laughs> <laughs> um how about this Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. That's a miracle. That's the separation of church and state in one sentence. So there's a miracle for you. We're going to go for a final question. I'm going to ask it for both of you, which, which is the question we began with. We're talking about the psychology of belief. Do we need God to make sense of life? Um, your one minute answer begins now, Sue. Absolutely not. That will do for an answer. OK. Do we need God to make sense of life, Jordan? Well, God is what you use to make sense of your life, by definition. This is one of the things I learned from Jung. The highest value, you have a hierarchy of values. You have to, otherwise you can't act or you're painfully confused. You have a hierarchy of values. Whatever is at the top of that hierarchy of values serves the function of God for you. Now, it may be a God that you don't believe in or a God that you can't name, but it doesn't matter because it's God for you. And what you think about God has very little impact on how God is acting within you, whatever God it is that you happen to be, let's say, following. It's been fascinating to share this time with you both. Thank you so much for being with me on the program. Sue and Jordan, all the very best. Thanks very Thank much you. for the invitation. Nice it. talking with you. <laughs>